Hi, good afternoon, everyone. This is Steve Hollander from Watson Farley Williams, where I'm a partner in the Capital Markets and Corporate Groups. Uh, thanks for joining on this uh, very interesting times we live in and uh, for listening to the panel. And without further ado, because I understand we're pressed for time as we always are in these events, uh, I'll introduce very briefly the panel and we'll just jump into some questions. Uh, in, in no particular order, uh, Christo Volpicelli, Managing Director of the Global Transportation Group at City. Uh, Eric Helberg, CEO of Clarkson's Plateau Securities. Uh, Ted Jadik, Managing Director and CEO and President of DNB Markets. Uh, Nicholas Duran, Director and Partner of Investment Banking at Fernley Securities. And lastly, Doug Mavernack, Global Head, Maritime Investment Banking at Jefferies. So thanks everyone for joining. We appreciate it. Uh, there are there's a text box at the bottom of the screen where you can type in questions and we'll try to get to them either while you're talking or uh, afterwards. But uh, I guess in the in the interest of time, we'll jump into the first question, which I think is probably on the forefront of everyone's mind, which is uh, can shipping companies raise capital amid uh, COVID-19? Uh, if anybody wants to jump in or I'll just start calling on people. Well, I guess it's a it's it's Thank an easy Eric. question with an easy answer, right? Uh, not that not not at the current time, uh, obviously. You know, given what's going on. Um, that being said, I think you know there is a lot of interesting dynamics going on uh, in the industry. I mean, if you look at the tanker space, it, it looks like a safe haven at the moment. I mean, you know, tankers are up month on month. Uh, I don't think you can say that about a lot of the other industries, but you know, we're getting a huge amount of call from investors that want to try to understand you know, what's going on. I mean, shipping is in the forefront, obviously, of global trade. Uh, you know, trying to understand what's going on in China, what's going on in Korea, you know, and obviously these are interesting questions because you know, they're kind of ahead of us in, in, in this very unfortunate situation we're in. Uh, you know, we have, as an example at Clarkson's, we have 53 offices in 23 countries. So we've got colleagues in Shanghai and Korea and Singapore. And the good thing is that most of those are actually, you know, going back to work or have been at work for some time. It's good to see that, um, that you know, we're seeing volumes and, and container throughput increase, you know, port calls are increasing. So uh, to answer your question, uh, you know, you can't raise equity now but there is a lot of activity in the market. Uh, you know, block trades, obviously investors that have to sell and others who are sitting with cash uh, who feel that this is an interesting opportunity to, to get involved again. Oh, sorry, Erica. Um, from the perspective of, of the broader market backdrop, I, I, think, I think there's two things to keep in mind. Number one, would shipping companies want to be raising equity in this backdrop? If, if you look at equity valuations year to date, um, pretty much all of the US listed shipping stocks are down anywhere from 25 to 60%. So, you know, the, the companies are trading at levels where if, if you're not needing to come to the markets for liquidity, uh, this is not the time to try. That said, fully agree with Eric, you know, the equity markets just aren't open. Uh, when you look at a key measure that we all think about as investment banking professionals in terms of the volatility index of the markets, typically we talk about normal levels, which are positive in terms of equity market in new issuance backdrop being kind of 15 to 20. Uh, the index kind of spiked all the way up to 80 which is just a level, you know, not even seen in the last financial crisis. So, you know, it has come back down again. Uh, but when we are looking at the volatility in the markets that we see today, this is, this is not a sector uh, where you will see companies trying to issue equity anytime soon. But fully agree, there's some really interesting things going on right now in, in some of the segments. And I think that as investors start to get comfortable with the broader backdrop. Nobody knows how long this is going to go on, right? The real elephant in the room is what happens to GDP over the longer term. And, and we need to get a sense for how coronavirus is getting contained first. But as we start to get a handle on that, I do think that investors will start to, to look at shipping again, uh, but it's gonna take some time. Yeah, and Steve, I would add to what uh, both Eric and uh, Krista mentioned is that rather than issuing equity at these distressed levels, what we've seen is um, we've seen companies buying back their own shares. 
And so it kind of illustrates that now is not the time to be a seller, but in fact, you know, some companies in some sectors are actually buyers of their shares down here. And it highlights a couple of different things. One, that, um, that there is a distinction to be made between sectors that are, are doing well right now, as mentioned, you know, the tankers are doing quite well. Uh, the dry cargo guys are not doing as well, but even there, you know, it's mostly the CAPE operators that aren't doing especially well. And you look at, you know, the smaller ship asset classes, those guys are doing actually quite fine. But, but you know, getting to your original question and, and um, you know, kind of adding to uh, Eric, uh, Eric and Chris's comments, you know, now's not a time to be selling. Companies are buying. It's highlighting the strength in certain markets, but then also I think, you know, this is something that investors have been waiting for within the shipping sector itself is responsible capital allocation. And so whenever, you know, you're not talking about, you know, value destroying raises at these levels, you're actually talking about companies that are doing accretive things to their own net asset value. I would just I more, comment, I would just comment briefly on the debt markets as well, because the other folks have talked equity. I mean, the, the high yield, the high yield bond indexes are equally bombed out, if not more so than equity. So they're not really a, uh, a likely uh, source of, of, of raising money. You, you, you wouldn't want to be raising money at the kind of yields that are, that are present in the market today. I think one thing that we've uh, seen uh, jumping back to equity is that you know, we have had approaches from some investors that have uh, started to feel that there's uh, good value in, in buying uh, blocks in, uh, in some of the listed equities. Um, but I think all these, uh, you know, discounts to underlying value or to NAV that people are talking about, you know, there's also certain fear out there. And that's what we've heard from a few investors that the NAV that uh, the different investment banks are operating or analysts are operating with is not actually the NAV. You know, values have probably come down. If you try to sell some of these assets in the market today, you're probably not going to find uh, buyers at the valuations that the analysts are using. Uh, to compile their NAV, uh, and so you know, I think that you know, as one investor put it to us, you know, I don't think I'm buying today at the, at today's share price. I don't think that is a 50% discount to NAV. I think it's maybe just a 20% discount. And uh, if that's the case, you know, I'll probably uh, wait for a while because I think there's still downside, and there are other ways to get the shipping exposure. So I think that's been a problem that we've uh, we've seen. I think it's just a little bit too early. Uh, people want to see a bit how the uh, values of the underlying assets play out when the dust starts to settle a bit before they start uh, coming in again when placing that's 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 our impression at least. Thank you. Uh, Eric and, and a couple others mentioned uh, obviously the tanker space doing pretty well. Uh, do you think there'll be other winners and losers post COVID-19 or you think it's going to be squarely tankers doing well and everyone else uh, not as not as well? Steve, my own personal view is that um, with the tanker market where it is right now, you know, we have to realize that the reason why tanker rates are so strong is that the Saudis and others are flooding the market with excess supplies um, at a time when jet fuel demand and other sorts of fuel demand is uh, declining. So this is going to end in a handful of months, if not sooner, with a lot of supplies. And whenever we've historically seen a lot of supplies having built, there's gonna be a necessary inventory destocking that comes about as a result. So what we've been advising our tanker clients to do right now is actually be responsible with the cash that you're building, either to maintain the cash that you have built. If you're gonna be buying back shares, you know that's a good use of capital as well, but then also can contemplate delevering here because you know we don't know, I mean, the way that we're viewing it is that some demand is being pulled forward in the tanker market right now that's gonna be satisfied through a destocking. When we see who got who can potentially benefit from COVID-19 and the after effects, we actually think that the dry cargo guys may be in a decent position because we know China's historical remedy to getting economic growth back on track is through some sort of infrastructure spend. And so if that translates into increased iron ore, coal, et cetera, in terms of imports, then while the dry cargo guys right now are the ones that are suffering, they could benefit from uh, stimulus efforts that uh, have historically looked like that. We completely agree. I mean, we think that uh, the first segment to benefit from uh, from the stimulus packages is going to be uh, uh, be dry cargo, obviously driven by uh, by China. We're uh, obviously much more bearish on, on everything that has to do with uh, with uh, with energy, meaning mm -hmm. both LPG and, and, and tankers. You're mm -hmm. on tankers. You're essentially just borrowing from the future right now, 
And so uh, whatever your benefit you're seeing now, you're going to have to pay for it uh, down the line. And I don't think it makes for a good recovery either because uh, it's too much too quickly. And uh, it, it's just going to mean that it will take a longer time before you can get back to the natural uh, recovery curve. Hmm. No, I, I, I agree to what has been said, but I think there's an extra element that we often tend to forget, you know, in shipping, which is not only supply, you know, it's not only demand, but there's supply. And the great benefit, obviously, now is that there's absolutely zero ordering. So when we go through, obviously, the success, let's call it production of oil, at some point, I agree, you know, we'll see a reversal. But the good thing is that we're obviously seeing the, the, the fleet shrink quite significantly as well as we move along, uh, which obviously will help benefit the market as we probably go into that weaker period and and then we'll see i mean if at some point if that's the case and obviously oil production will kind of reverse uh you know we might see a comeback in oil price and the whole fuel spread might work again and those that are planning on putting on scrubbers will continue to do so and that will also as this says a bit so it's a lot of interesting dynamics going on uh, and and then dry cargo I, I agree you know obviously the stimulus will help uh, if we have a prolonged unfortunate situation with you know COVID-19 obviously the dry cargo will have a bit of a challenge as we're seeing now you know problems going into ports uh, and obviously if you've chartered a ship and you can't kind of discharge or load it's starting to get a bit of a problem. We also see that um, an additional uh, constraint on the supply side you know in addition to what Eric mentioned that people are not ordering ships uh, we have heard from a number of uh, clients or issuers that um, there's quite a lot of uh, companies across all segments that have had vessels uh, sitting ready to either go through special survey, install scrubbers, ballast water treatment, whatever, and then all of a sudden, sudden the yards, you know, effectively shut down the repair yards. They can't accept the ship. You know, maybe you cut the the um, uh, the class certificates a bit short in terms of timing so you're sitting there all of a sudden for a month when you're just supposed to sit there for a week and your class certificate expires so you can't go back into trade until you've renewed that so I think there's actually going to be uh, things like that that will impact the supply side which we don't really see uh, readily you know when you speak to issuers at a operational level you hear these things here and there, and I think that's actually going to have an impact because I've heard from quite a lot of companies now that there is, you know, their entire fleet is not ready to start trading when the demand comes back because there's lots of operational issues that need to be sorted out. Hmm. Right. Thank you, Ted. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I was just thinking that you know the the, the banks are going to be a factor in in how things develop as well as as they always are, particularly for shipping. Um, I think it's it's early days, but um, I, I think it's it's probably fair to assume that, that banks are going to have challenges across their their lending portfolios. Um, sh sh shipping might actually be somewhat of a bright spot, um, but banks are going to have generally challenges across their lending portfolios, and and uh, you know the um, you know, the added capital charges that we know are present for banks when it when it comes to uh, to to riskier uh, riskier uh, lending uh, activities such as shipping, uh, I think we'll just continue to grind away uh, at the availability of credit for shipping generally. Um, so that I think has the impact of, again, certainly, certainly hitting on secondhand market liquidity, certainly hitting on um, new building ordering, um, you know, pluses and minuses for the industry. Uh, the other thing I think is, you know, we're all reading a lot these days about various prognoses of how how we're going to come out of this, and and it, it seems to me that the 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 broad uh, the broad consensus is we're going to have a a pretty sharp V-shaped recovery. It, it may not develop that way. It, it may different. It, it may develop in a different way, which of course will have a different you know uh, impact then on 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 how the different shipping sectors come through. Right. Thank you. Uh, going back to a point that was mentioned um, a couple of minutes ago about stock buybacks. Uh, what do you guys think about uh, bond buybacks? Are you seeing any currently, and do you expect those to increase or decrease uh, as as we get further into COVID nineteen? 
Absolutely. As, as was mentioned, you know, uh, that uh, it makes a lot of sense to use this, uh, as Doug said, you know, to use this period of strong cash flows for the tankers, as an example, to, you know, buy back, uh, buy back bonds and, and repay debt, uh, you know, and thereby kind of keep their cash break even low. So should we have a reversal of obviously a very good market now, they'll be prepared, uh, you know, to, to withstand that. So that absolutely. I'd also add, as it gets to the buyback topic, um, fully agree with Eric. I think it can make a lot of sense for companies. Just to pick up on um, some of Ted's commentary, I think you know the one piece of advice that we're also giving our clients in this environment is we just don't know. Um, and you know, if the recovery is different than people are expecting, growth falls off. Yes, we're in a great position across most of the segments in terms of the order book and supply, and limited capital will also deter new orders. But you know, we could end up having more of a demand problem than people are envisioning and in forecast and forecasting. And if that's the case, then you know, liquidity matters. And so it is a good time to think about reducing leverage, downside scenario planning, making sure balance sheets are healthy in terms of you know withstanding you know lower for longer in terms of rates. And so then when you think about capital allocation, you know buying back your equity can be tempting, buying back your debt at, at really good rates um, achieves, you know, the fact of delevering as well. You've seen some companies come out, you know, talking about dividend policy, and maybe they'll think about that a little bit differently. So I think it's, it's a, a healthy thing for management teams to be very mindful of capital allocation, but also to be mindful that we are in a very tricky environment to navigate. And so liquidity planning is, is just critically important in terms of preserving capital. We, we find people to be quite uh, cautious and conservative, to be honest. I mean, all the issuers we've talked to, and of course we give this pitch every day of the week to people these days, you know, how about buying back bonds, buying back stock? Uh, you know, they all, think that it makes perfect sense and, and that it's very tempting, but at, at the end of the day, they all get cold feet and say, look, we want to preserve whatever liquidity we have. It's very tempting, but there's just so much uncertainty that no one really seems to have the confidence to go out and do that in a big way. Maybe with the exception of some of the tanker companies, you know, we, we, we did, the, did a small block for a, a listed tanker company a, a couple of weeks ago and we note that there are some deals on here and there, but I don't think you're going to see it happening in a very big way until the dust settles a bit. Yeah, I, th I think my opinion is past experience tells you this, this industry really has to harbor uh, its its liquidity very, very carefully uh, in times that are that are this uncertain. Um, the shipping companies will not typically have the same ability to come back and access markets to uh, raise liquidity if they've paid a bigger dividend or they've bought back a bunch of shares and and suddenly the market develops in a way different from what they they had expected um you know other industries i think can are, are a little bit often in a more advantageous position when it comes to being able to tap the markets when when, when really needed um i'm not sure shipping is always in that position uh, and again back to the banks i'm not sure the banks are going to be really keen to see their shipping clients uh, necessarily um, using their liquidity for for uh, either either increased dividends or or uh, or share buybacks. Sounds like a small or it sounds like a small little pitch towards uh, bond buybacks because uh, has has a slightly different uh, I guess long term view. Yeah, that's what they probably should do at the current moment. Okay. Um, I know this is somewhat of a crystal ball question and I, I, I almost hesitate to ask it, but how long do you think, I guess, after COVID-19 dies down, do you think investor appetite will return? Well, as always, that depends on valuations, I guess, right? If valuations are attractive enough, you know, you will find bold investors that, uh, you know, we'll uh, dive into it if it looks, uh, you know, attractive enough. I mean, you have some of these companies that are, have super strong balance sheets. And I'm talking, obviously, most of them are in the tanker space at the moment. Really, really good balance sheets. You know, they have taken most of their CapEx commitments for the next couple of years, really, you know, at least in a big way. 
and you know, and the, the, the benefit with the capital markets is that they're forward looking, right? And we've seen a massive drop, you know, the last two, three, you know, four weeks. Uh, so we already saw so what's happening, obviously what's going to happen with the world and it's, you know, already priced in, in a lot of these names and some of these tanker companies are trading at, you know, $20,000 freight rate expectations. And, you know, that's, that's a pretty bearish scenario, you know, looking how much money they already made and how much money they're making at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I agree. Um, you know, there's a price for everything. Um, and so whenever you get a reduction in the volatility, um, you know, whether you're talking about a sector where earnings may not be growing, where the momentum may slow, there's a price for everything within that type of scenario. But if, if things happen in the dry cargo market, as we expect, and you start seeing a resumption of, of earnings, so if you see Cape size rates going to 10 or 15 or 20 or 25,000 a day, you can bet that some investors will be paying attention and try to benefit from, uh, from that uh, scenario. I want to make the point again with with the underlying values. You know, I think last time you saw dry cargo being, you know, a terrible state back in in 2016, early 17. Um, you had a lot of sort of deep value investors come in because you had data points that showed very clearly that you know the underlying values of all these dry cargo companies were at the historical low point. Right now, I think. People feel that dry cargo assets are kind of mid-cycle, and I don't think you're going to see a lot of investor appetite uh, across the different segments until you see a few data points on how this is all impacted the underlying values. Uh, because as we know, you know the, the the rate environment or the earnings environment uh, is quite fickle these days. You know, hackers were V's were down the drain a short while ago. Then they went up, now they're back down again to 70. There's a lot of volatility. Uh, and you know, shipping has to a large degree been about uh, the underlying uh, asset value. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think in times like these, you know, it's the deep value investors that come in first. And I don't think they're gonna come in until they see some good data points on, on what, at what discount are they actually buying? You know, what is mm -hmm. the, the, the underlying value? So I, I agree to that, but I think it's interesting also to note that in, in dry cargo, as, as you know, Nicholas mentioned, uh, you know, obviously there are owners out there who are cash rich and are looking, you know, to, to find some good, uh, you know, buying opportunities. But but I think it's a healthy sign that we're not seeing a bunch, a lot of distressed selling. You know, the, the guys holding on to these assets are quite keen to keep on holding on to them, mm. and and luckily, as opposed to in 2016, their balance sheets are significantly better than they were going into that uh, downturn. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it feels like the industry, generally speaking, is fundamentally much more robust than it was last time. And, and hopefully, you know, this will, will help most of them, you know, get through this, uh, this tough period. I think that's a fair comment. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, given the fact that, you know, we've been through down cycles across all the segments, you know, in the period of the last three or four years. Uh, I don't think you see a lot of uh, legacy issues with people's balance sheets, you know, people have been through the tumble dryer in the recent years. And so they're in better shape now generally. So I totally agree with Eric on that. I think also, as you think about how long it will take for companies to access capital, and we should probably add, how long will it take for them to access capital efficiently, right? Mm -hmm. Because companies want to be raising new capital when they can do so at valuations that make sense in terms of their overall cost of capital, mm -hmm. uh, not when they're trading it at massive discounts to their intrinsic value. I think we need to remember that when you look across the markets right now and what is happening, uh, there has been, you know, such a downturn in the overall markets, right? The S&P is down, you know, 26% year to date and the best performing sectors, whether that's consumer retail goods or healthcare, these sectors are down 25 to 30%. And when we start to see capital coming back into the markets, you know, there's a lot of other places where investors can find value right now in the markets. And now the questions are, you know, investors are starting to think about, you know, pricing in a global slowdown, pricing in a recession scenario, all of these things are kind of being debated right now as you think of the big fund managers and as they're looking across um, different asset classes. And, you know, if you look across, um, you know, this gets back to the discussion we've had before in these kinds of forums around, 
you know, shipping being a smaller cap sector in the context of the broader equity markets, smaller cap sectors tend to underperform. And when investors are putting capital back in, they will tend to flight to, uh, uh, to some of the larger sectors first. So I do think that that will have an impact. I think that we will see you know, the trends of consolidation in some of uh, the public shipping companies will continue uh, once we get through this. And I think you will see, you know, perhaps even more of a differentiation in terms of performance of companies. Time will tell, but I think that you have to look to the broader market backdrop and where investors are finding other opportunities as well when you think about the time that it will take to be truly having a functioning, you know, robust uh, capital markets backdrop for all of shipping. Yeah, Stephen, if I might be able to try uh, to tie what Krista and Nicholas just mentioned, um, you know, as we know, shipping has always been a sector that has uh, been challenging as it relates to um, attracting um, equity investors or just investors in general as it relates to the broader markets, which is relatively small. However, you know, as Nicholas was mentioning, if we see those data points that do suggest that there is a reason to get excited, um, and, and, you know, there's, you know, China focus, there's raw material commodity uh, focus uh, on the part of the um, investing public overall. And we start to see those improving data points and they do translate into vessel asset uh, stability and then potentially appreciation. Maybe that could be the, the recipe that uh, that's needed to, uh, to get investors to look at our space. I think Krista made a, an interesting point there because I think a lot of investment bankers, including myself in shipping, at least the ones that are very sort of shipping focused tend to forget that, you know, where there's a much larger universe out there. Uh, I was speaking to a, um, a uh, client of mine who's uh, in the gas space and he was talking about, uh, you know, whether to come up with the equity to uh, order some ships to participate in the tender uh, that the oil just put out there for some, uh, for some vessels. Um, and he went through the economics with me and, you know, looking at it and he could effectively expect to make, uh, uh, let's call it a seven to 8% uh, unlevered return uh, on that investment. Uh, and that same oil major is at the moment uh, yielding double digits. So, you know, <laughs> you can effectively get, uh, get equal good economics without uh, taking any operational risk, technology risk, you know, general shipping risk directly with the same underlying credit. And I just think that that speaks a lot about how cheap things are now and why shipping mm -hmm. is maybe not the first port of call to larger institutional uh, investors. Thank you. Uh, Krista mentioned uh, the the the, uh, the consolidation word when it came to shipping, so I guess now is as good of a time to any to ask. But uh, do you guys expect to see more or less uh, in the next, I'd say, six to to eighteen months, perhaps? Well, I think we should expect to see more. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it makes uh, a lot of sense in many cases. The companies become larger, more robust. They can access different type of of capital. Uh, you know, they make them more investable for, in, for, in, for investors. And, and generally speaking, you know, it's a good thing. It consolidates, it prevents people from running to the yards and ordering ships and you know, they can pick up great assets as they are. So I, I, I expect to see more and I really hope to see more. And, and uh, I think it's a very good trend. And I think it's a good trend, you know, kind of driven by the financial players that have come into the industry. You know, historically it's always been very challenging when you've got two strong owners and they both want the, names of their family members on the vessels and it's been super difficult, you know, to get those executed. But I think, uh, I hope and, and I expect to see more of that going forward. I think the financial players are an important part of the dynamic. And yes, I fully agree. I expect to see more. Uh, I think this is a theme that will be consistent for shipping going forward for, I think, a long time. Um, you know, think back to where we were six months ago and the broader themes around, you know, the various challenges the industry is facing. Um, they're they're still there. We 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 have this we have this situation that we're we're all grappling with today that is that is is kind of interjected itself. But uh, you know those same forces uh, that we all have been talking about for a long time, and we're kind of ramping up toward the end of 2019 as we came to IMO 2020, and and you know some of the 
you know, the, 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 the decarbonization type of themes, which again, they're, they're still there in the background. You know, people are still having to deal with those. Uh, and they're, they're just, they're just one of the, I think, several forces, if not many, that are going to continue to drive uh, the consolidation uh, trend here. I just, I don't think it's going to be efficient for smaller ship owners to, to stay in the business or, or, or economical. Um, and the bigger ones know they need to continue to get bigger to increase their attractiveness to the public market. Speaking of getting bigger, uh, something that uh, my firm has certainly seen a significant number of or a decent number of is uh, ships for shares deals, uh, where public companies uh, even pay all shares or, or cash and shares together uh, to sellers of, of ships in the secondhand market. Is that something that you think will uh, will play a big, a bigger part next year, and uh, especially, well, I guess, in light of the of the current market, or do you think that it's kind of uh, something that's that was that it was a novelty for a short period of time? Well, Steve, I, I think that depending upon how the markets recover, you could see more of that. Um, right now, it's a bit of a challenge because if you're that owner that receives shares, you get marked to market at lower the very next day, and it makes it a bit of a challenge. Um, but you know, to the extent that um, that you did see a trend of those uh, sorts of transactions, and to the extent that we do get some sort of recovery early 21, whenever that time takes place, you know, that is a an efficient uh, means by which you can get uh, a transaction accomplished. We had higher hopes to see more of the private equity firms that came in, you know, five, six, seven years ago um, to have driven more uh, ships for shares tri type transactions and uh, and uh, been stronger drivers in consolidation uh, but what we see today maybe you know in different segments especially over the last month is that none of them really want to take any kind of equity from a shipping company as uh, as payment uh, leaving aside the valuation uh, point that was made you know i think that Generally, shipping stocks are not very liquid. You know, if you're a PE firm and you have a $200 million equity position in something, you want to do ships for shares transaction. You know, even if you just take half of the payment in shares, you feel like you're never going to be able to get out of that position in a good way. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, we saw this with the, with the, the Hafnia uh, equity raise and IPO that, you know, there was so much concern about the overhang of, of uh, private equity and institutional investors that, that were there as a legacy uh, and, and people were really skeptical towards that and I think that the same problem we see now in in the sort of M&A space that um, some of these players that you would expect from a timing perspective would have uh, gotten a move on uh, are just not moving because uh, they'd rather sit and have control than end up sitting in, um, in a, as a shareholder in the listed entity that they can't get out of. Yeah. And, and Stephen, piggybacking off of Nicholas's point, I mean, conversations that we've had within the last month. Um, so I mentioned the valuation issue, issue which we believe is the, the primary issue. But, you know, to his point, the conversations are, I would only take equity from this company, that company, or the other. And, and sometimes it's just this, this and that. It, it, so it's, it's um, you know, those sorts of factors, overhang, liquidity, et cetera, very much play into the types of, of companies that uh, uh, investors would feel comfortable taking an equity stake in. And all that said, this is exactly why. So I, I think there will be more ship for share deals. There will be more consolidation. And you will see the larger players continue to have an, an advantage in doing that. It's a great point Doug raises. You know, some sellers may only be willing to take shares from certain buyers. We all know who those buyers are. And I think they will continue to have the ability to use their equity to continue to consolidate and that over time could be a great strategic advantage for those companies and so you know this is something that you know will take a little while to play out for longer but i i, I do think that it will start that cycle of, of more consolidation through some of these segments great changing topics for a second a little bit further astray from COVID 19 just just for a minute uh, what effect do you think ESG, which is, you know, environmental, social, and governance criteria will have on existing public companies and potential new entries? I, I think I can start. I think it's, uh, it's actually one of those really important long-term positives, for the lack of a word for the industry, 
I mean, we're seeing investors obviously putting a lot of emphasis on ESG, and, and if you don't have an ESG policy, you know, you're pretty much not investable in, in, in most of the investors, uh, you know, uh, mandates. So that's, uh, but I think it's, it's really good because, you know, moving towards the new targets in terms of CO2 emissions, obviously we need, you know, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the quest to find the right fuel. And the quest to find the right fuel is obviously leading all these public companies not to go and order uh, ships at yards because you know what is it the right are you buying yesterday's technology uh, and and that kind of just pushes out the supply side that we all discussed earlier on uh, which which you know i think we all believe will be a good cushion and support factor and let's call it you know uh, helping factor for shipping companies going forward the fact that we have such a low order book and and again you know it it puts pressure on companies to be professional to have you know real operational systems in place and and it will favor in a way the what we just discussed more consolidation and, and the creation of, of larger companies yeah again it was becoming an, an increasing part of the dialogue if we go back six months and during 2019 and nothing that's happening now changes the trajectory of that in terms of its growing importance in 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 in, in shipping in all industries um, it's a factor that um, uh, is going to be with all of us, and and uh, the right way to play it is to get on board and establish policies and procedures, and 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 um, you know g get the benefit of that. And as Eric said, you know, companies that aren't kind of looking at the issue in that way today, for many investors, they're not they're just not investable. And that's I don't think that's where you want to be. <laughs> Becomes a binary issue, so I think the debt markets are ahead of the equity markets, at least in shipping, in terms of you know some of the banks that have aligned around Poseidon principles. You know, people start to talk about green bonds in the equity markets. It's very much a theme that investors care about, and you've seen companies start to include that theme in their investor marketing, which I fully agree with Eric. It, it's it's hugely important, mm -hmm. uh, but it's you know also agree with the comment that if you don't have a policy or you're not thinking about these things, then investors start to look other directions. So it is something that is just part of the world that we live in. Uh, there is capital required to figure out where shipping is going to take this, and that's why there's all these industry initiatives of people working together, but it is increasingly a topic of, on investors' minds, both that and equity. I, I think it's just another factor uh, in in the um, you know limited access to capital uh, that we have seen and will see going forward, which hopefully over time will just you know create a situation where you for a prolonged period of time have a sustainable uh, supply demand balance. You know, the big lenders. Um, expect an, an, ES, an ESG uh, policy and, and look more closely at that. Certainly equity investors, like you said, uh, to some extent do as well. I just think that the, that's just one more thing adding on the constraint uh, or constrained access to capital that will mean that you know, people are not going to be making large new building orders uh, for a long time. And hopefully you'll see more consolidation because all the banks like to deal with larger corporate entities uh, that have an ESG policy, uh, um, policy uh, etc. Yeah. So I, I think. I, sorry. Go ahead, Nicholas. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no. So I just think this is yet another catalyst that's going to push things in the right direction. Maybe I'm just an optimist, but to me, there are so many factors that are pushing the whole industry towards something that will uh, put constraints on everyone, uh, that will hopefully lead to a, a supply demand balance that will. Be sustainable and, and and give us a long-term solid recovery. Yep, yep. And the only thing I was going to add, Stephen, is um, you know a lot of the commentary, not just on on our panel, but just in general, is on the E of the ESG. There has been a lot of focus on the S and the G as well. Um, I mean, we were talking about capital allocation early in the governance side. I mean, everything from transparency to how you allocate your capital responsibly, you know, seemingly is an attempt to try to uh, to fit into to some of those responsible ESG principles. Great, thank you. Uh, looks like we only have a couple minutes left, so I'll, I'll finish off with one one last question uh, on something again that, that Krista uh, mentioned, which is the green bonds. Uh, do you guys think, for example, that, that the green bonds are the wave of the future, and that you know, for you know, here on in, it's going to almost all the bonds will have to be green, or do you think that it, you know, it's it's nice 
to have, and there'll be a little bit, maybe, you know, they'll be, they'll, they'll, they'll be a little bit here and there, but they're still going to have a kind of regular business uh, as usual. We're, we're quite active in the, um, in the ferry uh, space. Um, as some people know, Norway has a very long coastline with lots of fjords, very inefficient for, for uh, building and maintaining roads. So Norway has a huge ferry network. That's a typical industry where, you know, they've been ahead of the curve uh, in terms of uh, adopting green technology. And that's a typical space that I think will, will be the first, see the first benefactors of uh, green bonds, you know, ferry companies that have uh, hybrid electric uh, ferries. Uh, we just financed some um, lush cruise ferries that operate in and out of the Norwegian fjords with tourists. Uh, those can operate on battery, you know. That type of asset uh, will definitely qualify for that kind of financing. I think it'll take quite a long time before you start seeing dry cargo owners trying to issue green bonds on the back of, you know, installing scrubbers on their vessels or having them dual fuel ready or whatever. I just think that's not going to be a component of financing commodity shipping for quite a while. That's my personal view. I mean, ultimately, right, anything that will help expand the investor base, you know, and the, let's call it investability will help. But, I, you know, I, I agree with the comments that ultimately, you know, it, it's, uh, we haven't seen a big pricing difference, to be honest. Uh, and ultimately, you know, if, if, if it's a good credit, uh, you know, people will buy it, uh, regardless of whether it's green or not, I think. Uh, if it's green, it will, you know, cater for a larger investor audience and maybe push down pricing uh, more mm. over time. You know, I think, I think as a product, you know, green bonds are you know, to me in a very early stage of their development. And, you know, there's a lot of new initiatives and the way people define them and light green and dark green and social bonds. And, and there's just a lot of different ways to play it. But I agree with Eric, if it diversifies access to capital, if it increases access to a more diversified base of capital, or source of capital, I think it's worth pursuing. Um, shipping, you know, to me, I think they have they have an opportunity to um, sell a story around green financing. I think it's more challenging, particularly if you're a, a crude uh, tanker owner or a product tanker owner or, or even an LNG uh, carrier owner. But I, I think there's a case to be made, and I think the investor base, as it develops, and, and the product develops will provide openings for shipping companies to tap into some of these products um, and hopefully on a basis that allows them uh, more advantageous economic terms. We haven't really seen that yet. We've seen a couple of loans that our bank's been involved in where, there, where there's pricing, where there's a grid that is linked to various uh, performance criteria related to uh, um, uh, emissions. Um, we were involved with the TK shuttle tanker green bond uh, last fall um, and we're in dialogue with a number of VSG investors who, who again I think they initially are quite skeptical to the idea of a shipping company coming and, and trying to raise something that's called green um, but I do think there's a case that shipping companies can make um, not all of them and not in every instance but, but to try and again broaden that 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 potential source of capital. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, looks like we are out of time. So, Sorry, guys. I didn't mean to steal the rest of the time. No, that's okay. It was just somewhat, somewhat of a positive note at the end, which is great. <laughs> uh, so just thanks to, to everyone, Krista, Doug, Ted, Eric, and, and Nicholas for, for joining. Uh, we'll try to answer some of the questions uh, below uh, afterwards uh, once we have a chance. And uh, thanks, thanks to everybody. And everybody stay healthy and stay safe. Likewise. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck, everyone. Bye.